The Buddha never claimed originality. You see, whether he had ideas from earlier people in Greater Magadha, or perhaps ideas borrowed from the Vedic influences that poured into Greater Magadha, at any rate, he doesn't claim originality. I walk on the path the earlier Buddhas trod. This whole idea of uh, anti-Brahminism being present already in the Buddha's teaching, that is uh, a modern invention. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the place of Buddhism within the commonwealth that is nowadays known as Hinduism. It is a very um, unpleasant thing nowadays to be called Hindu. So we have a whole series of uh, movements that emphasize that they are not Hindus. Like you have the, the rather conflictual case of the Sikhs who have been saying for a hundred years, Aham Hindu Nehi, we are not Hindu. There are a number of others, but now we want to focus on the case of the Buddhists. Now, in the case of the Buddhists, it is rather widely understood that they represent a separate religion. There are even writings about the relations between Hinduism and Buddhism, like as if they are two totally distinct religions coming from elsewhere and meeting each other halfway. Well, we will argue that the life of the Buddha himself and his interaction with Hindu spiritual teachers shows that the Buddha himself was entirely a Hindu. Let's start with a rather uh, simple consideration. Buddhists are often decried as navel gazers. And indeed in Zen Buddhism, it is the common practice to sit in meditation and concentrate on your navel. So you, you breathe in and it goes down to the point like just below your navel and then it comes back, but so your attention always goes there. Now the good thing about this uh, navel gazing is that it presupposes that you have a navel and a navel means that you have parents, that you have an origin, that you are part of a lineage, that you have been born as a heir, as a, as a having inherited an entire tradition of what came before you, that you have a debt to your ancestry. And so people have ancestors that comes from most of us that's why you have lots of studies of about every known great thinker about the influences that made him into what he was. An exception is Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. Historically, there have been studies about the influences on him. But right now, the whole question is systematically ignored or downplayed. And indeed, the claim is now propped up that he was a radically different mind. He had nothing to do with what surrounded or preceded him. At any rate, that is put outside of the limelight. So some say, in fact very many say, that he was a rebel against the ambient culture. And in the 19th century, this uh, was very consciously compared with the case of Luther, who rebelled against the Catholic Church, against uh, the Pope. It was also compared to Jesus, 
who confronted the Pharisees, just as the Buddha supposedly challenged the Brahmins. And so this is a, a model that you find, a scenario that you find among the topmost Buddhism scholars like Richard Gombrich from Oxford but also here in India very widely among the pamphletists and polemicists uh, who call themselves Ambedkarites or Neo-Buddhists. It is said, for example, when he did refer to existing Hindu traditions, like to certain uh, ideas or phrases from the Upanishads, that he used them only ironically that when he said the same thing, he meant the opposite. But at least this recognizes that he was in relation to what went before him. You see, even that is too much for some people. So they insist that he really was unrelated to the existing surrounding Hinduism. He uh, must have been incredibly creative because he invented all his teachings from scratch. He never inherited nor borrowed. But on the contrary, it is his surroundings that borrowed from him. And now I am still nice by calling it borrowing. You know, to believe some of these neo-Buddhists, they all stole it from him. So, and this goes quite far. For example, the um, Dutch Swiss scholar uh, Johannes Bronckhorst redates the Upanishads so that they come after the Buddha, so that the Buddha didn't borrow from them. No, they borrowed from the Buddha. There is nowadays a fairly active research about the history of yoga but strangely quite a few there like Philip Maas like recently um, well some others <laughs> who posit that yoga came about only as a Hindu digestion of Buddhist ideas that uh, there's a, a strong cut-off date uh, with the Buddha. Which is very impressive. I mean, at least as a description of the Buddha, it, it presupposes that he had it all uh, either from his own genius or from some divine revelation. But at any rate, it is quite superhuman. So these two schools of thought are one in assuming that everything worthwhile in Hinduism was borrowed from the Buddha. Indeed, in most introductory books about Buddhism, the position is uh, voiced in one of its variations that Hinduism is the problem and Buddhism suddenly arose as the solution. Or at best, if you want a slightly more organic relation between them, Hinduism was the preparation or the childhood, and Buddhism is the completion or the maturity. The Buddha used the term Arya all the time. His was the Arya Dharma, the, the, the noble religion or the noble teaching. And uh, he taught the noble truths, the Arya Satyani, and the noble eightfold path, the Arya Ashtangika Marga. So everything for him is Arya, that is the key word. And during the time when the Aryan invasion theory ruled, that was most often interpreted in that context, that he was an inheritor and a representative of Aryan culture, 
being the culture of the Aryan invaders. So uh, the Nazi Indologist Walter Hurst called him that great Aryan personality of antiquity, the Buddha. And indeed you see here for effect, I use uh, the example of a Nazi, but you see long before there was Nazism around, the whole atmosphere of 19th century colonial racism already presented the Buddha that way. Like uh, Thomas William Rhys Davids said in uh, 1896, that the Buddha was the only man of our race, the only Aryan, who can rank as the founder of a great religion. Buddhism is the only essentially Aryan faith which took its rise among an advancing and conquering people full of pride in their color and their race. See, that's not the kind of Buddha that the uh, Ambedkarites would like to present. But so many authoritative people have seen it like that for about a century. Christian Lindner, he was an Orientalist who, whom I have personally known, uh, a bit of an eccentric, but here very much in line with a scholarly tradition, uh, called the Buddha a preserver or reviver of the Aryan humanism, uh, rather civilized culture brought in by the Aryan invaders. So this was often contrasted with the Brahmins, but who are here presented not as Aryan invaders, but as, let's say, lapsed Aryan invaders who have mixed their religious practice with all kinds of superstitions that are ascribed to the indigenous people. Nowadays you hear more often the opposite view. The Buddha was not a late representative of the Aryan invaders to be contrasted with the Brahmin half indigenous superstitions. No, here the Buddha is a rebel of the indigenous people against the Aryan invaders, which of course presupposes that the word Arya has completely changed its meaning. Because here effectively this Arya, a word that he so emphasizes, uh, lands in the camp of the rebels against the Aryans. Now, this is not entirely impossible. I, I would call it unlikely, but it's not impossible, so let, let's consider it. Uh, Eke Narayan, an um, archaeologist from Benares in the university, whom I've also personally known, he uh, said that it is an irony of Indian history that Buddhism, and for that matter Jainism too, are regarded as heterodox against Vedism, an Indo-European gift to South Asia, which is taken as orthodox. This Shramana tradition, the Shramanas are the ascetics, the Buddhists and Jains, this Shramana tradition ran counter to the Brahmana tradition. It lay dormant and subdued for a period of almost a thousand years after its political and economic bases were destroyed by those incoming Indo-European speaking peoples, but survived in peripheral and refuge areas of India until it started reacting against the Vedic people and their culture. So what he says is that the uh, the Buddhists uh, represent a remnant, a reviving remnant of the indigenous culture that had been oppressed for a thousand years by the Aryans, but had managed to survive. And so it came back at some point. 
And this has become the received wisdom. This is what most introductions nowadays will say. Sri Kantalageri rejects the Aryan invasion scenario, but in an important respect, he agrees with this uh, thesis. You see, he points out that Hinduism cannot be reduced to the Vedas. There were a number of different centers of Hindu culture and they were different. They have all contributed to what historically has become Hinduism. But there is a serious, uh, seriously different emphasis. The Vedic culture comes from Northwest India, from Haryana essentially. It is centered on the Yajna and it has become the most prestigious tradition. And so the specialists in these Yajnas and in these Vedic texts and the surrounding sciences, uh, namely the Brahmins, they became a separate community set apart by society to maintain, to, to preserve these Vedas, and they spread all over India. And not by conquest, but by being invited. You see the kings in South India or in Bengal, they wanted to give more prestige to their own dynasty by importing Brahmins to uh, bring uh, a presence of the Vedic tradition in their kingdom. But nevertheless, originally the Vedic tradition belonged to a particular tribe, the Paurava tribe, the descendants of Puru, that lived on the uh, Saraswati um, riverside in Haryana. So you have another center in the northeast, Magadha, Kosala, uh, that uh, is known a little bit through the Puranas because the solar dynasty reigned there. So the, uh, the Vedas issue from the lunar dynasty. So here you have the solar dynasty and that's not just a different dynasty, that represents a different culture with different ideas and different practices. This is entirely logical. If you see in those days, there's a, a distance of some 2000 kilometers between them. Back then that was an enormous distance. And so that was more than enough to allow different cultures to grow. Then you have other practices in Hinduism, like the worship of gods through murtis, or idols that are housed in special buildings that are mandirs, temples. You see that didn't exist in the Vedas. Uh, so that's, that's another contribution to Hinduism. Uh, goddess worship that you mostly find in Bengal and Assam, although you also find it in every village really. But so it's a different source, it's a different tradition from what you find in this greater Magadha culture or in Vedic culture. So to say that there was a different culture in Magadha, different from the Vedic tradition, that's nothing revolutionary to say. And, and Bronkhorst was not the first to say it. So here we have Sri Kantalagiri saying it. Um, it's not spectacular, but nevertheless, it is a little bit controversial because it militates against the now common view that Hinduism, by definition, stems from the Vedas. Now, that's not the original definition of Hinduism. The word Hindu was brought into India by the Islamic invaders. Hindu originally was just a geographical term in Persian, uh, which is simply the, the local equivalent of the Sanskrit word Sindhu. And so it means those living on or beyond the Sindhu or Indus River. But when the Islamic invaders bring it into India, 
it acquires a religious meaning. Namely, it means those Indians who are not Muslim. So immediately he gets what they now call in India a communal meaning. Uh, it does not mean all Indians, like some sentimentalists are trying to say. Uh, it means specifically Hindus who, uh, or Indians who are not Muslims. But otherwise, it doesn't specify anything. So the Brahmins, the Buddhists, who are described as clean-shaven Brahmins, the tribals, including all kinds of Hindu sects that have yet to arise, like Sikhi, like uh, Vira Shaivism, you know, they all by definition are Hindu, whatever they may say today. You know, so this is the, the meaning of the word Hindu. Now, in the British colonial period, under Western, under Christian influence, uh, the whole idea of religion is redefined as something based on a doctrine, a doctrine which is laid down in a book. So religion has to have a book that defines it and a doctrine. Now, that's not the case with Hinduism. Hinduism existed even though the name did not exist, but Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma, with a more native term, existed before the Vedas. And the Vedas weren't even written down, they were only composed and learned by heart. But even if they had been written down, it would not be a defining element of Hinduism. Hinduism existed earlier and even later for very, very many Hindus categorized as Hindu, the Vedas played no role. They, they may, among the tribals and so on, many had never heard of it. Even if they had heard of it, it was something for these bookish Brahmins that played little role for, for common people. <laughs> but then you have attempts like by Bala Gangadhar Tilak to define Hindu in Christian terms, namely, what do you believe? And in fact, very many Hindus who meet Western tourists have this experience that Westerners with a Christian background ask them, but what do you believe? What is it that defines a Hindu? And so you see, he tries to say, oh, it means belief in reincarnation, but many of the Vedic Rishis never mention reincarnation. You know, maybe secretly they believed it, we don't know, but apparently not. Uh, it means belief in the Vedas. But first of all, what does belief mean? You see, if you say one and one is three, I may believe that, I can say it is true, or I may disbelieve that. But what do the Vedas say that you can agree with or disagree with? And anyway, the composers who created the Vedas, they had no Veda to refer to or to believe in. And they themselves speak of the Rishis who went before. You see, who, who lived before the very first Vedic hymn, right? And <clears throat> still you can't say, oh, they were not Hindus. They're going to hell. They had, did not have the true belief. No, that's not there at all. Uh, so, belief in the Vedas, no, that is not an element of definition of Hinduism. So, in the whole argument, uh, we are not Hindus, this is a recurring theme. Ah, uh, the Vedas are defined, we don't believe in the Vedas. Well, that's not good enough. It so happens that this mono-source view this idea that the Vedas are the source, nothing else is Hindu, Hindu except if it's Vedic. That idea is very congenial to the Aryan invasion theory. Why? Well, this scenario says that the Aryans came into India, and in the far northwest of India, they stayed for a while, that's where they composed the Vedas, then all of them were imbued with this Vedic tradition, and then they spread farther across India, taking this Vedic tradition with them. So all the Aryans, or you know, with a more modern term, Indo-Europeans, 
All the Indo-European speaking Indians are Vedic by definition. No. They brought this tradition with them. So <coughs> that is uh, very questionable. So it is more realistic, more in keeping with the data to say that there were different traditions. The Vedic tradition was only one among them that gained the most prestige perhaps, but only one among them. So uh, Bronkhorst calls this uh, area where the Buddha grew up Greater Magadha. And um, they're not very much wrong with this. I mean, of course, you can call that area Greater Magadha. That's, you know, that's not far-fetched at all. Um, but uh, he makes a slight mistake by denying the Vedic element in Greater Magadha. You see, the Vedic people had started migrating from the Northwest, according to me, at the time when the uh, Saraswati dried up, 1900 BC, at any rate earlier than the time of the Buddha. And so if the Buddha wasn't himself a physical descendant of these immigrants from the Northwest, at least he was influenced by them. And so to some extent, he may have borrowed ideas from them or he may have reacted against those ideas. So Bronkhorst's mistake is only that he denies or minimizes the Vedic influence that must have poured in in Greater Magadha during the preceding centuries. But for the Vedic period, itself he is entirely right to say that that was one culture and the culture of Magadha was a different one. And so what is typical of this culture of greater Magadha that is non-Vedic? So I think the idea of rebirth is not clearly present in the Vedic hymns. It becomes present in the Upanishads. And indeed, in the Chandogya Upanishad, it is stated very explicitly that this idea was new, that um, the, the local king knew about it and then revealed it, explained it for the first time to the Brahmins, to the keepers of the Vedic traditions. Indeed, it's the story of a boy who comes home uh, after his Vedic training, he has completed his Vedic training. He has learned everything, including the uh, Atma Vada, the teaching of the self, that is completely central to the Upanishads. And yet, he doesn't know about reincarnation. And so, when his friend, you know, that he used to play with long ago, uh, welcomes him back, he says, okay, so now you know everything. Yes, I know everything. Well, tell me, what happens after death? Oh, that was not part of our curriculum. And so then the king explains, okay, uh, what happens is that, you know, you go up there somewhere and then you come back in a new boat. And he adds, because we Kshatriyas, we know this, we have the power, which is a very interesting statement. Um, and so not you bookish, dusty Brahmins. No, 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 no. We have the power because we know that you never really die. You come back. And so if you're on a battlefield and you know that you're, you can't really die, then it gives you courage. Also, some people, like Arjuna in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, feel inhibited because they don't want to kill the other side. And so they're the same, the same fact counts. They don't really die. They also come back. It's like you take off your clothes in the evening and tomorrow morning you put on new ones. So, so this... Um, this means that people who believe that win the battle. And since they win the battle, they have the power. 
That's how the Kshatri House came to power, at least that's that story. Uh, at any rate, you see there, it is said very explicitly, more explicit than we can deduce from the absence of reincarnation in the Vedic hymns, that they did not know about reincarnation. It was new. Now what is interesting geographically is that the Upanishads start when uh, Yajna Valkya, Vedic sage, uh, author of the Shatapata Brahmana, when he participates in a debate taking place in Videha, present-day northwestern Bihar. And that then these new ideas come of the self and so on. Uh, so then he starts a life of asceticism. He, he uh, takes leave from his two wives. And so his farewell uh, to them contains the explanation of the teaching of the soul. So basically the whole tradition of, uh, of Hindu philosophy hangs by that farewell speech. So then you see totally new ideas come in. And it is not impossible that these come from Greater Magadha. And that it is upon contact with the culture of Greater Magadha that he suddenly like fuses his own Vedic background ideas with these new ideas. And so then the tradition of uh, Vedanta uh, of this uh, Vedic philosophy starts. The Buddha never claimed originality. You see, whether he had ideas from earlier people in Greater Magadha, or perhaps ideas borrowed from the Vedic influences that poured into Greater Magadha, at any rate, he doesn't claim originality. I walk on the path the earlier Buddhas trod. So that, that already puts a question mark over this uh, newfangled idea that he was extremely creative and everybody borrowed from him, but he did not borrow from others. At birth, so the story goes, he was predicted to become a leader, either a worldly leader or a spiritual leader, but at any rate, somebody outstanding. But that means that this type of ascetic already existed. You see, in the case of Genghis Khan, he became a great political leader, but there is no sign that he could have become a great spiritual leader. You know, this, this, this role of a spiritual specialist, that clearly already existed in India far more than elsewhere. Then there is the classical story of his four meetings. So first he has a few, uh, well, meetings, at least a few encounters that uh, don't, um, don't make for a very optimistic view of life. He sees someone sick, someone dead, and then more hopefully, he sees a sadhu, an ascetic, a renunciant. And it is that precisely that sets him on his typical course. It is that meeting that ultimately makes him into the Buddha. But what does that meeting mean? That there exists renunciants. He was not new in that. He did not invent that. You see, that role already existed. And he wants to follow this man, which means that this man has reached something. You know, there may be people who are desperate, but that's not good enough. There is someone who takes his desperation and concludes something practical for it, a certain lifestyle that he follows. And that, to some visible extent, provides an answer to the misery presented by the three earlier meetings. And so, this is not a surprise, this may be a surprise to the royal family. His father, the, uh, the president for life of the Shakya Republic, may not think beyond 
the ideal of political power. Maybe for him personally, this was not what he wanted. Uh, but at any rate, nobody around is surprised at this. You see, maybe they are surprised that he personally, having such a great chance in life to become the next president for life, that he spurns it and prefers becoming an ascetic. But at any rate, that people become ascetics, that's nothing new. Nobody expresses surprise at that. Then he starts uh, his search, and so he goes through different phases. For example, for a while he joins extreme ascetics who don't eat anything, and so his ribs can be counted because he's so thin. Uh, which means, of course, that that type of ascetic already existed. And so, to some extent, you still find that in Jainism. And Jainism, effectively, by its own account, is older than Buddhism. Like uh, in Varanasi, there is a temple for Parshvanath, who was the predecessor of uh, Mahavira Jina. And then they say that he's on the 23rd, so that there were many more predecessors. At any rate, this type of extreme ascetic already existed. He continued his search. The most um, contents rich information that we have is about his two meditation teachers. So they are linked with the Sankhya school. Sankhya anciently meant somebody like something like philosophy in general. You see, that is the, the most ancient Hindu philosophy preceding Vedanta and uh, strongly linked with yoga. And so it is often said that yoga is the, the practice that goes with the Sankhya uh, theory. So these are uh, Alara Kalama, who is described as a famous expert in breath control and meditation. And Udaka Ramaputta. And so they taught him two advanced meditation techniques, namely staying in nothingness. Here you already have the idea of emptiness that becomes a central idea in Buddhist philosophy. And entering the dimension of neither perception nor non-perception. And so this is described as the highest state you can get. So he masters these techniques. He becomes equal to his teachers. But he's still not satisfied. Because in his personal case, his motivation for practicing meditation is that he wants to get rid of the experience of suffering. Now, this is not a necessary motive for doing meditation. Very many people who practice meditation, including many people that I personally know, have not been motivated by wanting to get away from suffering. They just hear about meditation, they think it's exciting, let's try, you know, and then they, they fall for it, they, they, they feel it, it is doing them good, they continue it, and so the experience of suffering does not come in, in the picture. So for the Buddha personally, that was the reason, so he's looking for a way to eliminate suffering. So he had this idiosyncratic concern and so that gives him a reason for continuing his search. And so uh, this is a normal thing to do. Uh, in some introductions, this is said, you see, he, he turned away from his teachers in disgust. Not at all. That's not what the source text says. And indeed, I would interpret it with the phrase of Friedrich Nietzsche that you don't honor your teacher by remaining his pupil. 
So once you've learned everything, you go on. You continue your search. And indeed, the, um, the Buddhist Sutra that, that relates all this says a few things about their relationship after that. You see, there's no sign that he turned away from them in disgust. They remain friends, only they are now doing something else. And then when the Buddha has been sitting down under the Bodhi tree and finally uh, reaches Nirvana, one of the first things he wants to do is to send for this, these ancient teachers, so please, you see, I have something to share with you. You know, you made profit from, from my discovery too. Uh, unfortunately, they had already died. But so, uh, there is nothing wrong with these teachers. On the contrary, those meditation techniques that he learned, they remain part of the Buddhist curriculum. He had not turned away from them at all. And so they're supposed to be the final two of the dhyanas or jhanas in, in Pali, the meditations. So the last ones before nirvana. I mean, that's position of honor, I would say. Uh, here is um, Samdhong Rinpoche, uh, whose birth name I gather is Lopsang Tenzin. Um, I knew him vaguely uh, when I studied in Varanasi. He was the vice chancellor of the Tibetan University in Sarnath. So he um, later, he was also a few years the prime minister of the Tibetan government in exile. And so late in life, he wrote a book about Buddhist meditation. It's a very good, uh, uh, very easy to follow, but very precise. And so there he says, the Buddhists had no special methods which could be described as purely Buddhist. But they have several insights that are specifically their own. For instance, on the nature of samatha, calmness of mind, and vipassana, or alertness of mind. But the techniques are derived from those known in the Sankhya, Vedanta, and other Hindu schools of philosophy, and perhaps in other religions which teach meditation. Now, I don't know of any other religion that was present then, but yeah, in theory, of course, this is possible. So what he says is, that the techniques, the yoga, is basically the same. But the ideas that you build around your yogic experience, they can be different. And so different yogis who have the ultimate experience come down with a slightly different story. And so that is what explains the different sampradayas, the different sects within the vast Hindu commonwealth. So the yoga that Shakyamuni, the Buddha, practiced was not new, was not specific to him. But the explanation he gave of it, that is typical for him. So you have a certain experience, when you, so to speak, come down from it, back into ordinary consciousness, you try to make sense of it, and that then may be determined by all the ideas you've gathered before, and so that may be different from person to person. More from the Rinpoche. The Buddhist and the Hindu teachings, now here, of course, between brackets, I have to say that the term the Hindu teachings Hindu here has the usual, the modern, narrowed down meaning of Vedic. So um, I would say the Buddhist and uh, Vedic teachings about uh, the different stages of Samadhi, uh, of meditation, are similar. Um, 
So he says the technical terms may be different, but the grading of the stages of meditation and the systems of elimination of mental impurities are, with an occasional slight variation, common to all the ancient traditions of Indian meditation. Here, instead of Indian meditation, I might say Hindu meditation, which includes Buddhist meditation. But okay, this is uh, how he says it. So although meditational systems may differ in the beginning, when the element of, you see, all the, the teachings of how to do it and why you do it and so on, that's all fresh, you haven't meditated yet, it's still only an intellectual project. Okay, that may differ, but ultimately when you advance, the meditational systems all correspond to each other in the higher stages. So Buddhism is not really separate from meditation systems in general. You see, it is only in modern identity politics that people insist on the separateness of Buddhism. A few uh, Vedic elements in uh, Buddhism, the, um, the central Buddhist notion of nothingness or emptiness we just encountered in the meditation technique that he learned from Alara Kalama. The idea of um, neither X nor non X. This is a formula that you regularly find in Buddhism. Like in the meditation technique he learned, uh, namely neither perception nor non perception. So you find that back all the way in the Rig Veda, the Nasadiya Sukta. You know, very much studied for its uh, philosophical profundity. Starts with na asat na sat. You see, uh, so it is said that uh, the first being was not not, nor was. <laughs> uh, so th this this thought form of neither x nor non x is Rigvedic. And so key Buddhist notions, we are not surprised to find them earlier, in the Vedic hymns, in the Upanishads, in the Shanti Parva, the, the most philosophical chapter of the Mahabharata. Uh, we may guess that they existed in greater Magadha sources that we do not have in writing. Uh, at any rate, they existed before. He took them over. So you have, for example, already in the early Rig Veda, the um, image uh, evoked by uh, Dirgha Tamas uh, of a bird eating from the berries in a tree and a bird sitting next to him and only watching. You have, for example, something that many these days believe is a Buddhist notion, what they call in modern terms the holographic paradigm. Okay, that is already present yeah, the holographic paradigm means um, you have a uh, net that where all the knots mirror, contain a mirror that mirrors the whole net. You could, you know, there is a modern, a modern application of this is the, the, the genetic system. You see every cell of your body contains the genetic code that codes for your entire body. You see, that says about, you know, what, what, what hair color you're going to have and what blood group and how much you are prone to high blood pressure or to heart disease and so on. So everything, you see, that, con that concerns different parts of your body is nevertheless present in every cell of your body. Right? Now that's a, a modern, very important application of an idea that was already present, not just in Buddhism, but already in the Atharva Veda, where it is called Indra Jala, uh, the net of Indra. Reincarnation is present in the Buddha. 
Now here you see something may be said for this whole idea of greater Magadha. <coughs> it is certainly not central in the Vedas, but realistically speaking, between the Vedas and the Buddha, there are centuries. So by that time, the idea of reincarnation may have gained currency. At any rate, for him, it was totally uh, obvious. And so after his enlightenment, he says that now I can see all my past lives. And he applies this systematically. <clears throat> Whenever he talks about the past, he adds, you see, when this thing happened in this country and so on, I was, and then he describes his own incarnation from back then. So, I've rarely heard Hindus speak about their past incarnations. And so the idea of reincarnation is something that they pay lip service to, but that seems to play no role in their lives. Well, for Buddha it was different. You see, for him it was really absolutely central. And so it, uh, it becomes uh, very normal for Buddhists to apply it, to explain things. Like, for example, there is a friend of the Buddha, General Bandhula. So he and his wife are learners. You see, they, they absorb Buddhist ideas. Then this Bandhula and his two sons, who are also in the army, get a you know, are accused of committing high treason and they are sentenced to death. And after they, they've died, his widow says to her daughters-in-law, who have also been widowed, yes, you and I, we know that they were not guilty, but they have been punished because in a past life, they did commit this, uh, this sin. Well, maybe so. Maybe that's true. Though a skeptic would say, well, that way you can, you know, justify anything. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a cheap way of justifying injustice. It was not new to the Buddha. And, and so the fact that he absorbed it so thoroughly, or that he lived it so thoroughly, may indicate that it was already common currency in the culture he was born into. The basic problem of suffering is also mentioned a few times, uh, though here I guess you can't use the uh, mention of it by Patanjali, because Patanjali, unlike what many Hindu polemicists think, is deemed to be younger than the Buddha though he uses all kinds of old material. But so it is, it is quite possible that this is an element that he took over from Buddhism. Not, not impossible, and there's nothing against it also. The poisonous nature of desire that has also already been thematized in the Upanishads. And sometimes you don't know which, which was first. Like, for example, in Patanjali, you find the Brahma Viharas, the divine states of mind. And so they are fellow joy, fellow suffering, or what is more commonly known as compassion. Um, friendliness, you know, solidarity, and also indifference. You see, indifference is what you're supposed to feel when somebody you care about does something bad, you can't encourage him. You can't just boss him about, you see, no, no, this is wrong. So sometimes you just have to let it happen and try not to feel affected by it. So indifference. Anyway, so these are the divine states of mind. They're mentioned in, in the Buddhist classics, they're mentioned by Patanjali, who was first, we don't strictly know. If the Buddha was first, then his choice of words does not support the idea that he was anti-Brahminical. You know, I mean, he could have chosen any term. Since he was the creator, you know, he had the freedom to choose any term. Well, he chose that one. 
And so this whole idea of uh, anti-Brahminism being present already in the Buddha's teaching, that is uh, a modern invention. In fact, Brahma plays a role quite regularly in his teachings. It's also said that it is because of Brahma that after his Nirvana, he decided to go teaching rather than keep his discovery to himself. I mean, for him, like for most modern people, Brahma was a, a way of, speak, of speaking. Uh, you know, the, the, the Vedic gods are present for him, but they're just a way of speaking. And after all, his focus was on practice. So whatever you believe about what happens, it happened is not so important. You just have to do your practice. And so whether you believe in reincarnation or not, whether you believe in God or not, ultimately all that makes no difference. You just have to do it. So more so-called Hindu practices that he continued. Um, the, the, the use of the word Arya, of course, is entirely uh, connected with the Vedic tradition. Um, it, uh, it means Vedic as soon as, as soon as the Vedic tradition gets out of this uh, Paurava context. In Paurava context, it simply means Paurava. It means us, you know, fellow tribesmen. But so after that, it gets the meaning of Vedic. And so the fact that he always uses Arya again puts a question mark over the now common claim that he was an anti-Vedic rebel. That clearly he was not. But you could say that he did some kind of Vedic restoration, which you can compare in modern times with the Arya Samaj. Now the Arya Samaj was heavily influenced by Protestant uh, examples and so on, they sort of distorted the Vedic tradition a bit, but at the same time, the whole idea of reviving the Vedas, that was there and not for the first time. So it is, I mean, in the history of religion, you find this all the time, back to the roots. That's what they all say. So here also it is quite possible because the idea that uh, the Vedas are an authority that you have to confirm to and so on, that's not Vedic. You see, I mean, often they say, yeah, the Buddha was not Hindu because he didn't abide by the authority of the Vedas. But the Vedas don't abide by the authority of the Vedas. So in a way, you see, he goes back to the rather more carefree spirit of the Vedas than this uh, scripturalism of the later traditionalists. So this whole idea that the Vedas are absolute authority, that they're revealed scripture and so on, that is an invented tradition. Classical case of an invented tradition. You see, in the, in the tradition that they appeal to, this is not present. You see, later when the Vedas were complete, they were gaining in prestige, then you see they were projected ever higher into the sky and ultimately they, they acquired the divine status. And so then you see the normal human mental inertia falls for this simple scheme. Oh yeah, it's not ordinary people like us who created this. Oh no, it's so high. It must be a divine revelation. So you see this, this pushing the Vedas upwards is a post-Vedic thing. And so treating the Vedas as just normal, as just literature, now that's Vedic. So, um, yes, we were talking about Hindu practices. Well, he takes Brahma and Indra as witnesses uh, after his uh, Nirvana. He, um, as uh, Richard Gombrich uh, says, he quotes from the Upanishads. You see, he very consciously stands in the tradition of uh, yoga of renunciation that already existed. <clears throat> the fact that he calls his own path a dhamma or dharma, again, is in continuity with what already exists. <clears throat> 
And he also explicitates his uh, faithfulness to what exists. In the so-called seven precepts for non-decline, he um, gives a number of rules that states should follow if they you know, care about uh, sustaining themselves. So one of these is that you have to uh, keep up the existing festivals and pilgrimages and you have to take care for the existing sacred places and so on. You have to join all together in cultivating this and perpetuating this. You see, that gives you a cultural strength, that gives you a backbone that makes your society strong. So he says very explicitly, the ancient rituals, the ancient pilgrimages and so on, which in his case were largely Vedic. Um, and again, you see, it has nothing to do with the, the revolutionary image that they now want to give him. Note also that he himself preaches in the local language, but his followers give that up in favor of Sanskrit. Now, there, there is a lot of academic writing about why did they take to Sanskrit. Oh, it is because the royal courts, under the influence of the uh, ugly, evil Brahmins, took to Sanskrit that in order to plead their case at courts whenever they had to get rest subsidies from the king or so, they could plead their case in Sanskrit. And therefore, they changed over every, all their writings to Sanskrit. Hmm, that's not very realistic. You see, there is a very good worldly reason for opting for Sanskrit. When the Pali Canon was written down, first of all, it was already not in the language of the Buddha anymore. It's already two, three hundred years later. And it's also in a different region. So they take the local dialect, that's Pali. But even in that region itself, 200 years later, the language has changed. And in other regions, it has changed even more. So it's not practical. So what you need is a stable language. You see, Sanskrit as a so-called dead language doesn't mean it isn't used anymore, but what it means is it doesn't change anymore. So Sanskrit is Paninian Sanskrit. And so everybody tries to follow that. And I mean, till today, you see plays and poems and so on are written in Sanskrit, all by people who have learned from Panini and who are reapplying the same language today. Uh, so that's more practical. You see, if you want your teachings to be preserved, rather than getting yellow and, and, and obsolete, then you use this dead language. Right? That's not some Brahminical conspiracy or so. Note, by the way, that the Chinese word for uh, Sanskrit is Fan Yu, which literally means Brahmin language. Uh, there is no notion of a conversion of Hindu to Buddhist. You see, nowadays in articles about V.R. Ambedkar, this is said all the time, he converted to Buddhism. Now, the novices who came to the Buddha, please, I want to be your monk, they did not convert. They were initiated into this order, that's all. A conversion means, as was said to the uh, Frankish um, uh, King Clovis in 496, when he got baptized into Christianity, his baptism father said, now burn what you worshipped. And so, in the case of conversion to Christianity, it is either or. If you embrace Christianity, it means you break off with everything that went before. But here there is no such notion. And so, so Buddhists are not some, some special class of people. In fact, I've read sociological studies about the neo-Buddhists. And so, in spite of what Ambedkar wanted and what all the leftist intellectuals would like to have, uh, they don't break with their past. You see, they have a house altar with Shiva on it and, I don't know, Krishna or so. 
and of course the Buddha, and, and there will be a picture of Ambedkar also. Why not? You see, Hinduism has room for that. Uh, so it's not burn what you worship. So there was no notion of conversion, it's only Ambedkar who called his own thing a conversion. Then um, in numerous Buddhist temples, Hindu gods are venerated. To have a Ganesha in a Buddhist temple is not abnormal. And it is even more striking when you go outside India. You will see that in Japan, they have imported the Vedic gods. So you have the 12 Adityas, uh, that in Japanese are called the 12 Ten. Ten means heaven. Um, but so they are recognizable. Benzai Ten is Saraswati. You know, all these gods, they have a Japanese name, but they have an identity that is traceable to the Vedas. Or you have a Brahma temple in Bangkok. A few years ago it came into the news when there was a terrorist attack against it. Uh, but so centrally in Bangkok, one of the big temples is a Brahma temple. Built by Buddhists. <clears throat> now we come to serious stuff. I mean, grown-up stuff, you know, about all these gold statues and so on. You could be skeptical and so on. Okay, a serious philosophical point here, and that you will, of course, also find in all the introductions, that Buddhists don't believe in a self. You see, these Hindus, they believe in the self, but Buddhists don't believe in the self. Okay, well, what is the self? You know, how does um, Yajnya Valkya define the self? The self is nirguna, that is to say it is without qualities. It's not big nor small, it is not black nor white, and so on. That's, for instance, why the um, uh, bhikshuni, the, the nun, um, sulabha, in the Mahabharata, wins a debate against King Janaka about the nature of the self, in which she argues that the self is not gendered. You know, for, one, for once that I can say something, you know, in keeping with the woke spirit of the times, okay, the self is not gendered. No, of course not. It is neti neti. It is neither male nor female. Okay, so the self is neti neti, neither this nor that. It is empty, as the Buddhists are going to say. That's what makes it uh, immortal, eternal. You see, in the world, all the things arise and disappear. They have a beginning and an end. The self doesn't have an end. So that's a radical... Uh, philosophical meaning of self, but that is based on a very ordinary usage of the same word. So the word Atma originally means self in the sense of he looks at himself in the mirror, he washes himself and so on. So this self also has an ordinary meaning, it still has. So that is what, in, in terms of uh, modern psychology, you would call your personality, your identity, your ego. And that, of course, is fleeting. And, and nobody has any problem in recognizing that. So the ordinary self is impermanent. It is not really real in the sense that it comes and goes. And the Buddhists are right when, when they deny the reality of this self. But so do the Upanishads. <laughs> and so, contrasting to this fleeting world, they posit the self, which is not fleeting, which is not coming and going, which is not black or white, which is not big or small, which is not male or female. That's the self. And so, the Buddhist notion of no self really is synonymous with the Upanishadic notion of self. 
And that's not abnormal because, and now I want you all to watch this profound mathematical equation, plus zero equals minus zero. Whether it is a self or a no self, you see, self means emptiness. So whether you call it plus or minus, it really is zero. So I think that the controversy about the self, about which so many books have been written and so on, this is a silly misunderstanding. <laughs> it really shouldn't be there, and you really can't define a religion on that basis. But it is very strange that precisely in affirming their identity as a separate uh, entity, uh, the neo-Buddhists are emphasizing that their no-self gives them a separate identity from those who say self. That's, well, because you see when the Buddha says this and that has no self, well, a modern expression would be this has no identity. Mm, this is empty. Patanjali describes in the beginning of his Yoga Sutra that yoga is the stopping of the motions of the mind. The motions of the mind, that's not something vague or uh, ethereal or so. The motions of the mind means the states in which the mind can be, namely, he also enumerates them, sleep. That's the sort of the, the, the weakest state of the mind, if you want. Then true perception, you know, your waking, uh, use of the senses. False perception, hallucinations. Memory, being aware of everything from the past. And imagination that is to say, being aware or imagining all the possibilities that may materialize in the future. Okay, so yoga means stopping all these. So yoga is a zero state of, the, of, of consciousness. When consciousness is not directed outside, whether through the senses to the reality outside, or whether through the mind to the experiences from the past or those imagined for the future. Um, so all that is stopped, is silenced. Then what remains then, if you're still conscious, if you're not asleep, that also doesn't count, if you're conscious. You see, when consciousness rests in itself, that is yoga. So this is said in the, the Yoga Sutra, when the motions of the mind are stopped, then the seer, the consciousness, the conscious being rests in himself. The, um, the word yoga is used in the sense of yoga. It has already been used in other senses in the Vedas. But in the sense of yoga, it is first used in the Katha Upanishad. And there it describes uh, silencing the mind. Uh, yields the highest state, parama gati, the highest state. And so that is what uh, Swami Agehananda Bharati, a modern uh, sadhu of German uh, extraction, calls the zero experience or the zero state. So about the zero state, there is not much to say. It is beyond language. And maybe it is practical that those few who do want to talk about it, first of all, say that it is beyond language. You know, the, the introduction of all these spiritual self-help books, you know, it's beyond language. I really can't say anything about it, but, and then follows a whole book. But strictly speaking, it's beyond language. But when people have this experience and then come back to ordinary consciousness, 
then they create, they build a whole model around it, an explanation for it. And so there you get the origin of all the different sects. So under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha is sitting there, he reaches his awakening. Bodhi is awakening. And after that, he remains sitting there and, and for a whole night he's thinking about his experience and he's constructing essentially the philosophy that becomes known as Buddhism. So that's one of the ways of making sense of this zero experience. Around the same zero experience, other constructions are made by other people like uh, Jainism, like Sankhya Yoga, or like Vedanta. And so for them you could say meaningfully that they are all different paths leading to the same goal, uh, different roads, you know, going up and meeting each other at the same mountain top. Uh, so that there is some phrase uh, current nowadays about uh, equal equal truth of all religions. Now that's not true when you compare different doctrines like Christianity, Islam and so on. But it is true when you consider these different dharmas that all are centered around this same zero experience. And so there of course there are still intellectual differences but at least they are about the same experience. So the philosophies formulated outside the zero state, they may be different, but the zero state itself, that is the same. And so in that sense, I would say that Buddhism is one with Sangya, with Vedanta, with Jainism. And so all together, they make up what in the last few centuries we've been calling Hinduism. Thank you.